Oh, Alex. If you... Perfect. Great. Um, and Kasha, wondering if you can pull the slides up and we can get rolling. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Waterfront Toronto's public meeting on the Keyside Infrastructure and Public Realm Project. My name is Pina Malazzi, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Design at Waterfront Toronto. And the next slide. I want to begin by acknowledging that the land upon which we are undertaking waterfront revitalization efforts is part of the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. In addition, Waterfront Toronto acknowledges that, the, that Toronto has historically been a gathering place for many Indigenous people, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people today. As a visitor on this land, I feel privileged to be learning from and working alongside Indigenous partners in establishing approaches to reintroducing Indigenous ways of knowing and being to our urban landscapes as we're creating, that we are creating in the context of the Keyside Public Realm Project, and that we'll be discussing a little bit more today. With that, I want to welcome Shelley Charles, an Ojibwe leader from Georgina Island, part of the Williams Treaty, to provide some opening remarks. Shelley is the Indigenous lead with Monokamik Collective, which is the uh, Indigenous lead for the Keyside Public Realm and Infrastructure Project. She's leading our integration of Indigenous design and the Indigenous engagement. Ani, bojo, wewene bojo, mandakwe, Indigenous cause, maskinoja, gigon, ndodem, nangom, gijika, gegwechimigo, nadama, disil nadama, shin, jonyang, minising, ndonjaba, Wawase Gaminga Neashio Nigaming Minwa no Jumawaning. Nogum Gishigak Aptigo Chimigwecha Kinege Go Gamijian. Minwa Gibigano Nigoni Winwen Dana Mak Nodan and Wabanja Wanding Gabi Yung Gaye Agiweden Giwedenung Minwa Shkabe was Mother Biashkwandeming Nadama Desona Onadama Shin. So hello, uh, welcome, Ani. Thank you so much for um, being here. I'm, I lifted up those uh, opening words in my first language, uh, which is Ojibwe, and uh, most of the region in the GTA, uh, the Williams uh, Treaty, um, as well as uh, MCFN, uh, that, that is uh, our language, which is uh, Ojibwe, Ojibwe and Anishinaabe. Acknowledge the four directions and also I, I lit some um, medicine here. And really uh, the one of the one of the ways uh, that we open meetings when we have um, something very special that we're gonna be talking about and looking at and hoping to create dialogue. We acknowledge those four directions. And in the doing of that, uh, we acknowledge all people, all people from wherever, uh, whatever part of Turtle Island and beyond that they come from in an effort to come together as uh, one mind, a good mind, and that we listen to each other, uh, ask questions, and also validate everyone's uh, contribution uh, to this uh, very special project that we'll be talking about today. So Ani is a uh, hello uh, Bojo uh, is hello uh, as well. So you may hear that uh, time and time again. And for sure, you may also hear miigwech, uh, which is uh, thank you. And I always say op to go gichi miigwech because I'm really so thankful to be included and to be part of the amazing work uh, of this, of the many teams. Miigwech. Thank you, Shelley, for those inspiring words. Uh, next, I would like to welcome Deputy Mayor and Waterfront Toronto Board Member Asma Malik to provide a welcome and introduction. Uh, Deputy Mayor Malik is also the Councillor for Ward 10, which is the ward that the Keyside site is located within. 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Pina, and good evening to everyone. And thank you so much to you all for being here and giving your time for this important discussion. And a big thanks to you, uh, Shelley, for starting us off in, in such a good way. And with gratitude for um, the incredible work and the team that um, we're going to be hearing from today and whose work um, this consultation is going to be contributing to uh, collectively. As was mentioned, my name is Asma Malik. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm very proud to be Toronto's new deputy mayor and very proud to be the city councillor right here um, where this project is in Spadina, Fort York, Ward 10. And it's great to be here to hear the progress about, uh, that is being made on the Quayside public realm and most of all to be able to get your input, your reaction, your feedback into it. My priority is working together for a livable, affordable, and vibrant downtown. And that's livable and affordable, vibrant downtown communities and neighborhoods. And we know housing is desperately needed. And in a city like ours, we should have everything that we need to thrive alongside the growth that we see coming, especially in this part of the city. Excellent parks and public spaces, improved public transit, and most of all, prioritizing that that safe and secure and affordable housing. And there is really exciting and inspiring momentum on the revitalization of our waterfront. And that progress is a credit to the incredible work of Waterfront Toronto, City of Toronto staff, the collaboration of development partners, and the continuing advocacy of stakeholders, neighbors, community members who have supported the vision of a waterfront that we can be proud of. Earlier this month, um, we had a few opportunities for the public to be shown the revised planning application that will deliver the key side development, including critical new affordable housing, affordable housing for the long haul. I recently had the honor of attending the opening of a new child care facility at the Aquabella building and the opening of an incredible new community center, one young community recreation center. And this month, City Council approved moving forward the Waterfront East LRT with a significant investment in the design of this project that continues to realize and unlock the possibility and the potential that we see emerging right in front of us of this part of the city. Those are real successes that have been delivered by years of planning and commitment to building complete communities on our waterfront. And so tonight we're, we're here and we're focused on the public realm that connects us to the waterfront. And this work has been a fundamental element of creating our new waterfront and the key side project is being designed to raise the bar on all of those ambitions. Waterfront Toronto staff will continue to work on this design based on your input and feedback. And by the end of 2024, it will be ready to be implemented in phases as the key side project advances. Through early discussions, I have heard that applying the lessons learned from previous projects, carefully choosing plantings and trees that work in the local conditions, getting traffic and signalizing plans in place as soon as possible, and working on important connections along Parliament Street from the lake to the future Corktown station are among areas of interest and high priorities from our communities and the public, Tonight, I'm really looking forward to hearing your perspectives, your expertise as people who are who are living, working, moving around uh, the city and especially in our waterfront communities and how we can achieve the goals of our waterfront community that meet the challenges of the climate crisis and our leadership in it, equitable and accessible neighborhoods, and of course, creating spaces that are welcoming to visitors, uh, uh, places that businesses can thrive and places that we where we can all uh, call home. Thank you all uh, to, uh, for being here again. Thank you again to the staff from the from Waterfront Toronto and city divisions who have prepared um, the presentation tonight. And once again, thank you all for giving your time. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion, the questions and the feedback as well. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, what an excellent context for our discussion uh, this evening. With that, I am going to turn the meeting to Liz, who will be um, facilitating our discussion today. Great. Thank you, and miigwech uh, to Deputy Mayor Malik, 
uh, Shelly and Pina for that opening. Before I pass it on to Pina, I'm just wondering if we can pull the slides up so we can go through just our plan uh, for tonight. We've got lots of interesting uh, information for you all, and it's so great to see so many of you here. So if you haven't met me before, my name is Liz. I'm with a firm called Laura. We are an independent facilitation team. With me tonight is Alex and Vincent. So just give a wave. Um, we've been retained by Waterfront Toronto to help focus in on the public engagement for the infrastructure and public realm for Keyside. Um, and one of the items is to facilitate meetings like this. We are also working alongside the Stakeholder Advisory Committee and some of you I see here this evening um, and continue to work alongside Waterfront Toronto consultants and uh, DTAH is here tonight as well. Part of what we do um, is through these conversations, we work on and write a report um, from the conversation tonight as well. Uh, there is going to be a questionnaire that will, is posted online so we can share that with you as well. I did say at the beginning that the meeting is being recorded, but I just want folks to know that um, as well. So thank you so much for joining. We are looking forward to a great meeting. You'll see many folks here from Waterfront Toronto. Um, you'll also have lots of information shared through a presentation. We will have an opportunity in several occasions uh, because the agenda is kind of divided into four parts um, to have a discussion at the end of, of a couple of the parts. We also have um, some polls to get some feedback from you. So the purpose tonight really is to introduce the Keyside Infrastructure and Public Realm project to you. Um, that's essentially the ecology, mobility, movement, and activation. Um, you did hear, or some of you have been participating in the development as well. This focus is really around the public realm and infrastructure. So all the pieces that kind of knit it together. Um, we're going to offer an opportunity to answer your questions as well as get feedback. So you will be hearing from Pina Malazzi, who you've met from Waterfront Toronto, followed by Yvonne Lamb, a partner at DTAH. Pina will provide the context of what we're here tonight to talk about uh, in Keyside. Uh, Yvonne will talk about leading with ecology, then we'll stop for discussion. We'll focus in on mobility and movement, stop for discussion, and then activation and amenities and stop for discussion. So again, Tonight really focuses on ecology, mobility, movement, activation, and amenities. We do have some questions for you. We really wanna know um, if this approach meets our goals, if there's anything missing. Um, do we feel like this is a space that you can get to easily around by transit bike or on foot? What else the team needs to consider and do the active suggestions for activation seem appropriate? So that's essentially our meeting in a nutshell. Um, again, we are really excited that you're all here. I think we had almost 300 people register and I think there's a there's almost 100 people on now, um, which is wonderful for a Monday night. So with that, I will pass it back to Pina to start the presentation. Good. Thank you, Liz. Go to the next slide. As Liz uh, mentioned, I'm going to start the meeting off by providing some context um, for the Keyside Public Realm Project, which is uh, essentially the public realm uh, and infrastructure associated with the Keyside Development Project, which is a 12 acre site located on the eastern waterfront. Um, waterfront Toronto is leading the development of the Keyside Precinct. Uh, we, as an organization, were created in 2001 by the three levels of government to oversee the revitalization of the broader uh, waterfront area. We work with partners, including property developers, city departments, agencies, community groups, and we create parks, public spaces, and mixed-use communities, all with the goal to support the economic, social, and ecological growth of our city. On the slide in front of you, you'll see uh, the designated waterfront area outlined in blue. And within that, the red uh, L-shaped uh, pattern is the location of the Keyside site, which is a 12 acre development parcel on the Eastern side of our waterfront. If you go to the next slide. As you can see, the area surrounding Keyside, um, this photo shows some of the Keyside site, well, the bulk of the Keyside site, as well as the East Bayfront area, has seen quite a transformation. 
in this photo from 2005, uh, the sites were mostly light industrial uses and parking lots. If we go to the next slide, a photo from 2021 shows a number of significant projects that have emerged in this area. Uh, many led by Waterfront Toronto, including the Water's Edge Promenade in the foreground, parks like Sugar Beach, Sherburne Common, Aiken Place Park, um, and many different development buildings along uh, this piece of the waterfront frontage, uh, both completed and underway. We move to the next slide. It gives you just a little bit more of an overview of what's happening already uh, in the immediate context of the Keyside site. Um, you can see the three waterfront parks highlighted in green, some of the development in yellow, as well as blue, some commercial institutional uses, those are the yellow ones, some mixed use in, in blue, as well as the Water's Edge Promenade wrapping the frontage of uh, the East Bay front in purple. The Keyside site is highlighted in red on the uh, aerial photo. Go to the next slide. Again, the Keyside site in context, the parcel of land is at the eastern end of Queen's Key. Queen's Key ends and merges into Parliament Street uh, within this uh, parcel of land and is really a connector. It's connecting the western waterfront to the future eastern waterfront. It's a connection point between Villiers Island and the rest of the city. Um, and it is a connection from the north to the southern side of our waterfront and the water's edge promenade. We go to the next slide. Our project has three streams of work. We have development parcels. There are five development parcels in total in the Keyside site. Those are being led by our development partner, Keyside Impact Limited Partnership. There are streets in public realm that we're going to talk a lot about today. These include Queen's Key, the local streets, Silo Park, and the water's edge promenade. And there's a lot of municipal infrastructure required to make these sites ready for future development. Waterfront Toronto is leading the streets and public realm and the infrastructure scopes of this project. We go to the next slide. This, um, the vision for the East Bayfront area is really being guided by the Central Waterfront Secondary Plan and the Keyside site is covered by two precinct plans. The East Bayfront precinct, on the left half of this slide or the west side of the Keyside site and the Keating Channel Precinct Plan on the right half of the slide or the east, everything east of Small Street uh, in the Keyside site. These plans identified opportunities for development and they had a real focus on creating a network of spectacular parks and public spaces in the area. We'll go to the next slide. We had these plans in mind when we developed three overarching goals, a series of different design principles and three overarching goals for the Keyside project. We worked on these very closely with our stakeholder advisory committee. And I'm gonna take a minute to walk through, oops, uh, to walk through these. The first one is, um, you want to go back one slide, Kasha? Oop, actually, move forward. Great, perfect. Uh, we want to create a dynamic space, one that is um, lively, uh, year-round place to live in and visit, in, and that actually uh, enables uh, a space that can be used for all seasons. We want to create a design that's consistent with other spaces on the waterfront and want to ensure that the design of that of all of our public spaces meet a high level of design excellence. So you can see here on the slide, activation engagement, continuity with the broader waterfront and design excellence as three principles within the category of dynamic. Maybe if we want to go back to inclusiveness, speak to that for just a bit. Um, through the feedback we heard from the Keyside Stakeholder Advisory Committee and from the community at large, uh, it was really important that the community Keyside community felt inclusive. This included uh, planning for accessibility of, for people of all ages, from all backgrounds, and of all degrees of physical ability. And uh, we're really excited that this project is going to be the first project to go through our newly uh, founded Waterfront Accessibility Advisory Committee. 
the committee is made up of people with lived experience and it'll help implement um, our new draft waterfront accessibility design guidelines. So uh, we'll be bringing all of our projects going forward at the 30% design milestone to this committee for their input and then at a latter phase to ensure that we have uh, really integrated their input into the process. And if we go to the next slide. Um, perfect. Finally, we heard about the importance of pushing for a higher level of sustainability standards. And I think we'll talk about this quite a bit tonight, um, make our communities as um, physical environments that are more resilient, really setting new standards for sustainability, for health and well-being, and integrating within that lessons that we learn um, from our Indigenous partners on how uh, we can uh, create uh, real ecological landscapes. Moving to the next slide. Now we're going to zoom in a little bit uh, and speak through the specific project elements within the Keyside site. So you can see the same L shape on the map here defines the um, entire Keyside area, which consists of 11 different uh, infrastructure and public realm projects. So very quickly walk through these, starting with number one, which is right in the middle of the plan. Uh, Parliament Street, as I noted earlier, uh, currently um, merges into Queen's Key at a 45 degree angle. Uh, the Keyside Infrastructure and Public Realm Plan will realign Parliament or will align Parliament Street um, to the with the street to the north, and will continue Queen's Key, which is number nine on the map, east of where it ends today, uh, to the front of the silo uh, sites on the east side. So that covers number one and number nine. In order to do that, the first piece of work uh, that we have to do is number ten on the map, which is we have to fill in the northern tip of the Parliament uh, slip area uh, to enable Parliament Street to be aligned and Queen's Key to move east. That forms the structure of the five development parcels that are the grayer areas uh, within the map. Um, maybe I'll next talk about Parliament Plaza, which is number two on the map. So flanking the two sides of Parliament Street are two uh, plaza spaces uh, that uh, act as a gateway when you arrive down Parliament Street to the waterfront. Those will be uh, landscaped heavily and provide a green gateway to the waterfront. We're not going to talk too much about Parliament Plaza tonight um, because that continues to be coordinated with the adjacent development given the kind of uh, proximity of it to Block 4 and Block 3 of the development. Just go through some of the other streets. Um, trying to go in numerical order but maybe I'll just go from west to east to make it a little easier. Number eight on the map is Bonnie Castle Street. Most of Bonnie Castle Street uh, is already completed, but the east side has not yet been finished. So as part of this project, we'll complete the east side of Bonnie Castle Street. Um, Lakeshore frontage, the entire northern um, frontage of the parcel or the south side of Lakeshore will be completed. Uh, we look to learn from lessons of uh, the piece that was completed behind the Moan site and continue uh, with, with that uh, same motif to the east here. Small Street will get uh, transformed um, into, and we'll learn a little bit more from Yvonne about how we're transforming that. Uh, street A, which is number four on the map, Street D, which is a small street on the south end of Quayside. And then of course, there's the Water's Edge Promenade that'll wrap the uh, easternmost block, block five and number 11, which is Silo Park. Uh, and we won't talk too much about Silo Park today because it's a little later in our delivery schedule. So we have not yet commenced uh, design for that. Maybe if we go to the next slide, just a little bit about timing. Um, as uh, the deputy mayor mentioned, um, we are on track to start construction on the public realm and infrastructure uh, components in 2024. Uh, we will begin with the Lakeville construction first. So that's the triangle that was on the map um, early in 2024, and then later in 2024 with the streets and the infrastructure, the municipal infrastructure. Next slide. 
Uh, we've already done some public engagement. We've talked to a lot of people through our stakeholder advisory committee, through the open house we held in East Bayfront in May, through a lot of summer pop-ups all across the city and across the waterfront. Uh, and today we wanna hear from you. As was mentioned, there's gonna be questions as we go along, as we talk about each of the three themes, they're up here on the slide. Um, and um, I will let Liz maybe take it from here and uh, move us into the next portion of the presentation. Liz, thank you. Yeah, um, I'll move it right over to Yvonne. Yvonne, if you wanna introduce yourself to start this part of the presentation. Sure. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Pina. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. On behalf of the design team, um, I'm going to be taking you through the um, design of the Keyside Public Realm as uh, the very uh, detailed introduction that's been provided. Um, I'm from a partner from DTH. We are the design, uh, landscape design, and public realm designer, uh, along with West State on this project, along with a large consultant team. Um, with WSP and uh, others on the um, working with Waterfront Toronto to deliver this exciting project. So we are going to talk about the design in three overall themes. So we'll go to the first theme, which is a leading with ecology. Next slide, please. So from the very beginning, um, the one of the kind of overlying underlying concepts that we uh, really dro drove the design is this idea of a continuous green edge. Um, as you saw in the context of the neighboring, um, the adjacent neighborhoods, this is really a key connection between their kind of built urban environment of the downtown core and this kind of newer um, and exciting uh, new precinct that's coming in the Keating Channel precinct as well as Sevilliers Island. So this is sort of a, a link between the two um, and this exciting Eastern waterfront. Um, so we really wanted this to have a continuous green edge to tie everything together. So what does this look like? Um, we can go to the next slide. Some of these imagery um, on the next slide, we can illustrate the um, some of the aspirations that we had thought about um, approaching this project. The images on the top, um, are you know existing palettes that we've already established um, on some of the existing projects along the waterfront, uh, combined with some international uh, examples on this layer, um, and maintaining that consistent and continuous approach that we've developed in terms of language and palette, um, but bringing in uh, a different level of an uh, approach to planting, considering microclimate, um, making it functional and intuitive and legible, and also creating this kind of human scale um, as, as uh, from a kind of pedestrian experience perspective. So the other thing that we are applying here, uh, if we go to the next slide, is um, taking a lot of the lessons learned that we've um, been able to uh, harness from all the work that we've been doing um, on previous projects along the waterfront. Um, so in this, we had a tour um, working with the city on some of the uh, learning from them on some of the maintenance and planting details that um, they've established, as well as um, learning from other projects that they've done over the all over the city, um, how we can improve them and ensure that the, from a maintenance perspective, whatever we put into ground um, can be kept up and maintained, and which is a pretty important part of um, ensuring these sort of green infrastructure elements uh, and public streets they can survive and thrive. Another uh, example of this is the Queens Key West pilot project. Um, some of you that may have seen, um, it's testing some of these ideas that we will be, you'll be seeing later on in the presentation of what we will be applying in Queens Key East, um, adding a planting zone uh, between the Margument Trail and the guideway and the streetcar tracks. Um, which helps with uh, clarity of mobility movements, as well as um, it, adding another layer of free infrastructure into the streetscape. So we're learning from uh, how the planting is doing and how that's um, helping with uh, establishing clear movement uh, for pedestrian and other street users on the street. Um, also looking at different ways of uh, de dealing with edges and um, details, um, zooming into the details of planting and st street elements like the planter edge as an example you, you see here. And also um, other kind of more scientific monitoring that we've been doing 
looking at um, the tree health of other uh, trees that we've done and in, implemented in other areas of the waterfront, really looking at the species, uh, which ones have survived um, and are thriving and which ones are not doing so well and adapting the palette uh, based on the findings of those previous experiences. And also looking at uh, monitoring the groundwater level and looking at how we can mitigate, um, as we all know with climate change, uh, rising lake levels and how we can mitigate and ensure that what we put in is uh, as resilient as possible as we move into the uh, future decades. Next slide, please. Another uh, important element of the design and which is, which is very tied to this idea of a green edge is integrated uh, an integrated indigenous approach to design. And I'll invite Shelley to jump in and uh, talk to any of these items, but at a high level, um, we are so pleased to have Minoka Make as part of the team, not only as um, to help us engage with indigenous and community, uh, as well as um, working with us to identify elements where um, we can find opportunities to engage with the community. So some of these uh, high level elements include planting species and material selection, um, ensuring that pl places that we create are p uh, places for all people of all ages, um, prioritizing restoration, healing, connecting with the urban forest, um, using um, typologies that are tied to the indigenous uh, history of, this, of the site, like the savanna, for example, um, to structure the landscape approach um, and design towards the landscape palette and, um, and uh, aspirations of the, what that would look like. Um, connecting with the urban population and the natural landscapes, um, as well as the natural habitats for indigenous plants and urban forest groves as well as creating spaces that are uh, that can support community spaces for social gatherings and as well as arts, language and cultural heritage of all different kinds of people. So these are uh, things that we will be um, engaging the community on and hope and looking to integrate into the design as we move forward into the next phase of the, the design work. Next slide, please. So some uh, act examples um, of how those are being integrated into uh, some of the project areas that's part of the project. Uh, for example, on Lakeshore Boulevard, um, this is another pilot project that has been done um, along Lakeshore, just on the north side of Shoreburn Common um, between Bonnie Castle and Shoreburn Street here um, at planting, um, plant, a planter here that was installed about two years uh, two years ago, I think, um, with the uh, with the support of TRCA, who is doing ongoing monitoring so that we're looking forward to the, reviewing the findings from the monitoring, um, again, to look at which plants are doing better and really adapting the palette based on the findings there. As you can all imagine, it's quite a harsh environment on Lakeshore. So this the, the data that we, we capture here will be really important and uh, helpful. And next slide, please. Similarly to this, um, we are dedicating, um, make, ensuring that we try to dedicate as much space as possible to ensure that we have this robust um, open planters so we could support the robust understory space that we, to create this um, idea of this urban forest that we're trying to create and really balancing that, um, but balancing that with the space for um, this, uh, human use as well, but also with ecology. Next slide. In a similar fashion, uh, along the waterside promenade, um, this is a summary of uh, some of the various segments that has been uh, in, in implemented throughout the waterfront, moving from the west to the east. Um, there's various various iteration of that. On the west end uh, at Bathurst Key, for example, this is quite a, a hardscape condition and, uh, and moving along towards the east, we have the more kind of signature lens, um, language of the double row of trees and tree pits and signature benches. Um, we also have instances where we are, have the trees and open planters um, in the center along Young's, near uh, the Young Slip, for example. And as we move towards the east, um, this idea of this more greener edge and more lush environment, um, we are implement we're trying to integrate the, this idea of uh, this robust understory. So moving towards a more open planter, um, condition, uh, integrating some of these ideas, uh, some of the language that we've already established, maintaining that consistency, but introducing kind of more, um, more immersive experience here. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Liz on some of, we're going to get into some questions, I believe. Great. 
Thank you, Yvonne. Um, so I just posted in the chat how to ask a question. So I, I mentioned in the beginning, we've kind of broken this up into three parts to give people time to kind of ask questions or provide feedback on the specific um, specific focus areas of the presentation. I also know that we did have a question about whether the presentation would be made available online. And the answer is yes, it will. Um, so I've posted it in the chat as well. Um, so just a reminder, uh, you can use the Q&A function to ask a question or you can raise your hand. Um, you can just click the little raise hand icon um, and we can get to your question. And I will, uh, once I get to you, I'll just call your name and unmute you and you can you can ask away. However, we do want to get a little bit of feedback from you. Um, so Alex, we've got a couple poll questions here and I'm gonna move it to you so you could ask the questions. Thanks, Liz. Uh, so we've got two questions uh, in this poll on ecology. Uh, we've got, um, they're on the screen now, they're also in the poll. So how important is the resilient planting systems and vegetation in the public realm? So that's uh, the second question. Uh, and then the sec and then the other one, which is, uh, we've got them out of order, uh, but it's uh, to what extent do you agree with the concept of a continuous green edge that creates an immersive and welcoming space? So I can see that uh, we've already got a um, bunch of responses that have come in here, uh, which is great. Just wait a minute as we uh, as those those continue to climb. Got about fifth, almost approaching 50 responses, which is great. I love it when they work. I'll give people 10 more seconds and then we can share the results. Okay. So for both of the poll questions, uh, respondents were largely saying that these are very important. Um, it's very important that these, or important that these are resilient planting systems uh, in the public realm. And um, a lot seems to be a good level of strong, uh, strongly agree and agrees on the concept of a continuous green edge. Uh, although I'll note that there's uh, there's a couple comments in there um, that these are kind of moderately important or that they just dis people disagree with these concepts. So that's um, we'd love to hear more on on both sides of of what people are thinking there. And there'll also be room in the survey for people to expand upon those um, that feedback as well. Liz, great, thank you, Alex. Okay, so now I'm going to open it up to questions. I see that there are questions coming through the Q&A. So the way we're going to do this um, is that Alex is going to sift through those, read them out. The team is going to work to um, answer them. And we also have, uh, we'll go through some of the questions with the raised hand. So I'm going to start because I do see someone's hand up. Um, maybe do we want to drop no, let's not drop the slides because we might actually need the slides. Um, all right, I'm going to go to Michael. Michael, you should be able to unmute. And there we go. Introduce yourself um, and then ask your question. Okay, thank you. Um, my name's Michael Bethke. Um, indigenous cause, Michael Bethke. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a 72-year-old Caucasian male with white hair and a Van Dyke wearing a blue shirt. Uh, I'm uh, uh, involved with the East Waterfront uh, Community Association. I uh, just wanted to go back to the slide um, in Pina's presentation, the scope of the pro of project components, uh, and particularly uh, where we were talking about Area 10. And I'm thinking that one of the things we want to uh, look at here is resilience. So how will Waterfront Toronto and QILP ensure that the filling of the slip in this area will protect the surrounding area from water leaking and flooding. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, great question to start. So Pina, wondering if you're 
if you're available to answer this question um, about resiliency uh, and just to ensure that there is no flooding. Yeah, maybe I'll also probably ask a follow-up question. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing here vis-a-vis -vis the lake fill first, and then maybe ask Michael just to explain in a little more detail um, what areas he's concerned about vis-a-vis -vis flooding. Um, in terms of the lake fill, the way we will um, kind of a, undertake this project is that it consists of first, well, it consists of a dock wall on the southern end of the construction. It's a little further north than this blue uh, square is sketched out to be. It's actually a little smaller. Um, and uh, then we will backfill uh, the area within that sort of triangular area. Um, while we're doing this work, we would have silk curtains in place to ensure that any sediment that gets moved around doesn't impact the harbor uh, more holistically. Um, as part of the work, we will also be installing quite an extensive amount of habitat uh, within the slip as well, along the face of that new dock wall, as well as on the east uh, dock wall, uh, extending down the side. So we are in looking to improve um, quality within the slip. This is one of the slips that does not have a combined sewer outfall in it. So actually, we're also benefiting from that. So there's a real opportunity with installing um, this fish habitat to actually improve um, quality habitat within the slip. Now, when you're talking about flooding, are you talking about while we're under construction or post-construction? It would be post-construction. I'm, And I'm pretty sure like you would have uh, a cotter dam or something that would uh, block everything. You, I think you said a curtain, so it would be uh, something that would be blocking in there. But, uh, you know, once you've got everything um, set up in that, it's a, quite a, a large triangle that's going there, and mm -hmm. there'll be road access over top of it mm -hmm. and streetcar access in the future over top of it with the Waterfront East LRT. So yes. we're I'm, that's more or less what I'm uh, interested in. If uh, we've got uh, uh, issues with the lake rising uh, yes. and uh, and this type of thing, so, okay, so I think the answer to that question will be around the height of the dock wall. So yes. the height of the dock wall we will set so that it sits above uh, TRCA's requirements from for the hundred year, uh, you know, flood levels as well as for the high water levels for Lake Ontario. So there should be no water breaching the new dock wall onto any of those areas of land that we're creating uh, mm -hmm. post construction. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Pina. Um, Alex, I don't see hands up. So perhaps you can go to some of the written questions. Yeah, for sure. Um, so one of the first, we've got a couple questions about um, the plantings. Uh, one of them is just around uh, who's in charge of maintaining plantings, such as trees, once uh, plantings are in place. Uh, this individual, I think this came from Elizabeth, was noting that uh, some, she's, her experience has been that uh, some are managed by business, some are managed by BIA, some by the city. Uh, so it's challenging to report when uh, a planting needs assistance. So uh, if the team is able to, to respond to that at all. Probably another question for me. Um, Pina. Um, so I, I, we don't have a black and white answer to that. We have, we are going to be working closely with the City of Toronto, with the BIA, and with the local developer to establish a strategy for maintaining this. We know we are proposing to plant, you know, a fairly substantial amount of green infrastructure here. Uh, and we think that's a good thing, but we also want to ensure that A, we design it to be uh, very hardy, and B, uh, we have, before we build it, a plan in place for its long, long-term uh, operations and maintenance. Thanks, Pina. Um, we've got a couple other questions that are related to the planting strategy. Um, people are curious about 
uh, how many planting species are being considered if that's known at the moment, uh, and if there's any types of uh, kind of plantings that you wanted to highlight. Um, yeah, there's two questions that kind of dealt with uh, biodiversity and planting species. Uh, maybe Pina or Yvonne? Yep, I can take that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can take this one. Um, we are certainly looking at a variety of different species, um, and uh, this, um, this, the slide that we were looking at previously that uh, speak to some of the lessons learned from um, some of the existing uh, projects that we've had done. So really looking back, um, doing an inventory of what what has been successful and uh, adapting that to the palette that we are establishing. So. I don't know the exact number at the top of my head, but um, we are also looking at um, strategic um, locations. Um, for example, there's a slightly different palette for Queens Key as compared to uh, the inner streets and as compared to uh, the Water's Edge Promenade. And that has to do with um, how exposed, uh, for example, the trees on uh, the planting on Queen, um, the Water's Edge would be a little bit more exposed and, than the inner streets. So, a slightly different strategy to the different locations. Um, we I did see in the question also whether evergreens are being considered. Uh, we are considering some of that um, in some of the streets. Again, it's quite, um, there's slightly different strategy in different locations. Um, so we are studying that in detail. Um, we'll get into a little bit more detail of the exact species in the next design phase, but um, a, a variation, uh, not only the tree species, but as well as the understory planting as well. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, Liz, I'll turn it back to you. I have one other question, but it's more related to transportation and mobility. Uh, so we can maybe hold on to those ones for after that section. Okay, perfect. Um, and I, Michael, I see you've got your hand up again, so I will go to you. Hopefully, hold on. Are you there? Got it. Yep. Okay. Um, just wondering, um, with the considerations that you've taken regarding the green edge along Lakeshore Boulevard East, I'm just wondering, and um, particularly with the, um, uh, the what you call the overstory, I guess that's the lower planting. Uh, I hope I'm correct on that. Uh, anyway, um, right across the street at, um, at Bonnie Castle on the north side, there is an entrance uh, from Lakeshore Boulevard West to Bonnie Castle. Now, it's a, a nice gentle curve as it goes around there, but there are some plantings there that nature just put there, and uh, they've grown to about three, four feet in height. They're quite bushy, and they block people's view of the oncoming traffic. So I'm just wondering if there is some consideration that you can make, and just a, a safety thing to keep the plantings low, uh, uh, particularly at, let's say, Bonnie Castle and uh, Small Street, uh, so that uh, people can, you know, uh, inch their car up and not have to, uh, you know, just take their lives in their own hands trying to get into Lakeshore traffic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could uh, respond to that one too. Um, yeah, that definitely is something that we consider as we're developing the palette and also um, the massing of the planting. So uh, sight lines is definitely a very important aspect. So close to intersections, we definitely look to have lower planting that will not obstruct view uh, views and sight lines. Um, so that's an important consideration. Um, I think the, and and also, um, yeah, so the, the strategy of localized kind of application of the palette has to do with lots of things like the success of the specific species to the environment, as well as things, more practical elements like sight lines, as you mentioned. Great. Thank you, Yvonne, and thank you, Michael. Um, I think let's keep going to our next topic. Yvonne, uh, back to you. We're going to do mobility and movement now. So for folks who are uh, participating, just think about whether this is a space that you feel you can easily get around by transit, bike, or on foot. Um, and is there anything else that you'd like us to consider? OK, Yvonne. All right. Thanks, Liz. All right. So yeah, this segment um, will focus on the mobility and movement around the Keyside developments. Um, so just a little bit of context, um, going back to the introductory slides that Pina presented, um, Keyside itself 
again, is sort of this hub that is going to connect the Eastern waterfront um, to the to the core. Um, and within within that, um, in the context of transit itself, there is, of course, the Waterfront East LRT that will be coming on board. That's the Queen's Key pink line that's shown in the center that will bring high order transit into the Portlands and Billiards Island that will cut straight through the Keyside development. Um, in also the big dash blue line on top, the Ontario line, of course, is also coming in the future. So those are the two kind of higher order le level transit that that's, will be surrounding the Keysight site. And connected to that, of course, there is the um, local buses that are interspersed um, amongst the major arterials, as well as the various bike infrastructure um, on or um, including the Martin Goodman Trail that will be extended um, as it exists now, but will be extended as we redevelop Queens Key East um, and bike infrastructure as well on Lower Sherborne um, on Parman Street, which is part of the Keyside development. Uh, we will be incorporating uh, bike infrastructure on Parman Street itself. And of course the Martin Goodman Trail that will be running on Cherry Street. So um, all in all, um, there is, uh, we hope to, provide a multitude of ways to move and get around um, within and connected to and from Keyside District. So zooming into that, um, next slide, a major component of this, of course, is the Queen's Key, um, Queen's Key East itself. Um, so this is a cross section showing what the future condition would look like with the transit. Um, as the deputy mayor mentioned, the council did approve the 60% design of the transit project. So that's very exciting. Um, so this would be what the ultimate condition of Queenski would be when the transit does come on board. Um, you could see the, uh, the integration of the green infrastructure that we had talked about, but um, in transit itself, um, ex an extension of what, what essentially has been implemented in Queenski West, west of Bay Street, um, pulling it through to all the way to Cherry Street. So next slide. Uh, will show the, this is the, the scope of work that we'll be implementing um, immediately uh, along with the other Keyside infrastructure elements um, because the transit design is uh, going along with the rest of the transit project. So in advance of that, um, we will be implementing the rest of the streetscape, uh, uh, but space, uh, space proofing for the transit, incorporating transit enabling infrastructure, um, which are elements like designing space proofing for the tracks, um, installing deep infrastructure like the traction power depth bank and chambers that you see um, north of the Maringaman Trail in that zone so that we don't have to come back and rip up uh, finished landscape or finished Maringaman Trail to install those deeper elements in the future. Uh, installing the track bedding so that uh, again, to minimize the disruption in the future. So in the future we would come and um, we could just minimize the removals that we have to do when we install the tracks, um, including installing things like stubbing out for the track drainage so that, again, we don't have to rip up the road curb in the future to do that. And in the interim, the surface of the streetcar tracks will be uh, will be seeded with a metal mix or a kind of grasses so that um, as, a, as a temporary surface um, until, the, until the streetcar comes along. So um, as we're designing the street, we are uh, anticipating the future uh, el transit elements um, while supporting the you know, roadway function of Queen's Key itself, as well as of course the um, cycling infrastructure on Martin Green Trail um, as an active uh, transportation, mode of transportation. Next slide. Similarly, in the north-south uh, north -south direction, a major street connecting Keyside um, to the rest of the city is Parliament Street. Uh, we are introducing, a, uh, with the Lakeville and the extension of Queen's Key, we will be realigning Parliament Street. Uh, right now, it's a bit of a sharp, acute angle that connects Parliament Street down to Queen's Key. So with the extension of Queen's Key of, over the Lakeville area that we had just recently talked about, um, we are able to kind of normalize that intersection at Parliament and Queen's Key at a T intersection. Um, we're introducing a slight curve to the geometry of Parliament Street um, to, as a means to, um, as a slight traffic calming measure, as well as a different experience as you approach the waterfront. Uh, within Parliament Street itself, we, uh, as I mentioned, there will be bike infrastructure that cur currently does not exist um, on that stretch of Parliament. So this is, uh, will be implemented in certain phases. On day one, we will be installing uh, bike lanes on both sides of the street in each direction. So northbound on the right, uh, southbound on the west and connecting to the existing bi-directional bike paths uh, on either side of the lakeshore as they exist today. 
And uh, with the coming on board of the future Villiers Bridge, of course, there will be also uh, informal connection to Villiers Island through through the bridge um, when that is implemented. As Queen's Key gets extended to Cherry Street, um, the Martin Gimmon Trail, of course, connects up, uh, connects all the way to Cherry and down into Villiers Island. Um, and at that point, the existing bike uh, infrastructure on the south side of Lakeshore will be uh, will be replaced uh, in with that Martin Gimmon Trail connection. Um, so that will provide a more direct um, connection to Villiers Island uh, via Martin, Martin Gimmon Trail. And in the future phase, um, when the, the Lakeshore Public Realm, um, which is a separate uh, and distinct uh, project that is uh, will be implemented in a in a different timeline, uh, when that comes on board, there will be a bi-directional infrastructure on the north side um, of Lakeshore that runs east-west. At that point, um, the the anticipation we anticipate that we'll have we'll implement the bi a bi-directional bike path um, on the west side of Parliament Street so that it completes the kind of circuit of a bi-directional trail on the Maringaman Trail running along Queen's Key and then running up Parliament and then connecting to um, the east-west path running along Lakeshore and eventually extending north onto Parliament. Um, so this is uh, a future phase and uh, but we are designing it the space so that we can convert um, Parliament Street to this condition in the future and on the east side, the bike lanes become an additional public realm space. All right. Next slide, please. So at, uh, at the Lakeshore uh, Boulevard East and the Parliament intersection itself, uh, with the realignment and reconfiguration of Parliament Street, um, we will be redoing and, and uh, making the, in the intersection safe. So the angle of the intersection will be changing with the realignment of the street. So that will provide us with a more, again, a, an opportunity to normalize that intersection a little bit. Um, right now it's quite an acute angle, as, um, similar to the connection at Queen's Key. So we'll also have an opportunity to provide a safer environment to connect the bike infrastructure across the Lakeshore intersection as well, connecting to both the existing and in the future phase, the future bike lanes, uh, bike path on Lakeshore. And that's an image of what that may look like um, on the east side of a uh, small street. Um, this idea also incorporating into all the inner streets are this idea of uh, ensuring that we have ample space for a pedestrian moving throughout the district as well. And with that, we'll pass it back to Liz. Great. Thank you, Yvonne, um, for sharing mobility and movement and how we get around Keyside, um, I just want to remind people how to ask a question because we're going to break for uh, some feedback now again. So I can see that the Q and A um, is being uh, is being used. So that's great. We've got some questions there, and you can also, if you want to ask a question live, just press the little raise hand icon, um, and we'll go to you um, when it's your turn. But first, we have a couple poll questions, uh, because there are some things we'd like to know. Um, Alex, the survey that we have online has these questions in it, right? Like for folks that can't, that haven't been able to access the poll? Yeah, that's right, Liz. So okay. these poll questions are, are, gonna, are also in the online survey. Uh, we just wanted to to get your input tonight as well, but if you can't respond to them here, you'll also be able to respond to them on the online survey. We'll add the link to that survey uh, at the end of this meeting. Uh, so the two questions that we have about mobility and movement are, uh, how do you envision moving through Keyside? Uh, so there's a couple options there. Uh, and if you respond other, there's the option to also provide a short answer of how you would move through Keyside. Uh, our other question is what factors contribute to your sense of safety and comfort while walking? And again, this one has the option for um, a couple other responses. Uh, because this is a bit of a longer question, Liz, do we wanna take um, maybe one or two questions before I close the poll? Sure, um, and I do see someone has their hand up, Jeffrey, so I can go to Jeffrey for a live question while the poll is coming in. Does that work, Alex? Sounds good. Yep, okay. Jeffrey, over to you. If you want to introduce yourself, you should be able to unmute. Hey, uh, 
So good evening. Hi, Uh, how are so you? good. Uh, so I currently, um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I currently, uh, uh, I ride my bike. Uh, well, all my anticipated visits to the waterfront will be, um, on bicycle. So I think, um, um, an important consideration or, uh, uh, you know, I think you might consider it a minor detail would be the, uh, the curb and how they're built um yes uh well a lot of places there uh it's it's really important because uh you know, cycling infrastructure once it gets built um it stays that way for you know uh, uh for 20 years so and if and if the and if it's completely smooth like at um i think uh there's a such a curb on the martin goodman trail uh, immediately south of the parliament, uh, then it's yeah you know, yeah then it's great for cyclists. But if the curb is um, uh, designed like uh, that uh, that curb cut at um, the Martin Goodman Trail at the Red Pass Factory, it's you know it's a bit more of an issue. It's um, a little bump. Um, I know small detail, but um, uh, you know certain details matter and. Uh, um uh and i think that uh that bump is about i think two in, uh, an inch and a half so um yeah i just wanted to comment that um uh, uh that detail matters when um uh you know uh in the design and construction phase thank you great jeffrey and although a small detail. It's a detail that matters. Um, so, right. So you've addressed that an important consideration would be the curves and how they are built um, from the team. Just wondering who wants to, who wants to weigh in here, Yvonne? Sure. Yeah, I can respond a little bit on that. And right. these are certainly things that um, I'm thankful for the comment. And th these are definitely details that we spend quite a lot of time <laughs> actually looking into as we are in the uh, in the detailed design phase of the project um, we really do scrutinize um, how those edge details are as, uh, as implemented and how and the context of them um, so for example on queen's kit itself um, we have the planting on both sides so which does provide that delineation i think that um, and it's a slight departure from the queen's key west current condition, for example, where we have uh, planting, the tree planting are on hardscape and it, there's a gentle swale, but there's essentially on the same level. So in Quisquia East, we do have a slight great difference between the Martin Gwynn Trail and the adjacent um, sidewalk, um, as well as the planting that delineates the pedestrian kind of walkway space um, with the Martin Gwynn Trail. And on Parliament Street itself, we are studying that relationship between um, the sidewalk and the roadway and the bike lane. Uh, currently, we're looking at a condition where perhaps the the, the bike path is um, kind of midway between the road and the sidewalk, but we're still looking into those details um, with that conversion that we saw in those diagrams. Um, that's one element that is making it a little bit complicated because we want to also make sure when the bike lane gets converted into um, part of the public realm in the future that we don't have that kind of trip hazard or that um, great change. So these are certainly details that we're working through and um, considering. Great. Thanks, Yvonne. Jeffrey, does that help answer your question? Jeffrey, you there? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, the, uh, yeah, the primary concern is, you know, uh, where, wherever the Martin Goodman Trail crosses a road or a driveway, such as, you know, where it crosses the, uh, the Red Path driveway. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so it's, yeah, it's directed to that. Right. Yeah, that particular condition, um, I guess that that particular condition is not part of the key side limits of work, but as we pick up the design of that piece of Queen's Key will will certainly be um, taking that feedback. Great. Thanks, Yvonne. And thank you, Jeffrey. Alex, I'd like to go back to the poll um, just because, yeah, I think it's ready. And then we'll get to some more questions. 
Yeah, so lots of good feedback on the poll. Um, so the first one of how people are moving, envision moving through Keyside, lots of people uh, indicating walking, biking, taking public transit, but also still uh, some people also choosing uh, driving and other micro mobility options. Um, and then in terms of factors that are contributing to sense of safety and comfort, uh, wide sidewalks was the highest, but we can see that there's a lot of different factors uh, that are important to people about how uh, we move safely uh, and comfortably through this new area of the city. Liz, do you wanna take a spoken question or do you want me to take some written ones? Um, I can go to, I think, Felicity, and then uh, for a live question, then why don't we go to some uh, written questions, okay? okay? All right, so Felicity, you should be able to unmute. Are you there? Yes, hello. Yes, thank you. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I just wanted to make sure that um, provision will be made for people using wheelchairs and walkers. Uh, hey, Tina? maybe I can jump in on this. Uh, yeah. We we for sure will design the public realm uh, to meet AODA standards. Um, and as um, I, I mentioned uh, early in the meeting, we'll also be bringing the project to our newly um, created uh, Waterfront Accessibility Advisory Committee. Uh, which includes um, people with lived experience um, with living with disabilities to review uh, the whole project at the 30% and in this case, a little later, 60% design milestone because that's the point we're at, at this uh, right now um, for their input. So we're aiming to do better than AODA. Thank you, Pina. Do you just want to touch on AODA, what it is, sure. just in case folks aren't aware of it? Yes, those are the requirements uh, set by the Ontario government for us. Uh, it's like a code, essentially, for us to design to from an accessibility perspective to ensure that all uh, public realm is uh, fully accessible to people using mobility devices. Okay. Thank you, Pina. And Felicity, did that answer your question? Oh, yes, thank you very much. Great. Okay, thank you. All right, Alex, why don't we go to you for some written questions? Sure thing, Liz. So we have a couple questions about the Martin Goodman um, trail. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of bundle a few together um, that are similar. Uh, so the questions that we got were about, um, and maybe this is one for Yvonne, just if we can clarify just what steps have been taken to try to reduce conflicts between uh, people who are using the trail, like runners, cyclists, um, people on scooters, that kind of thing, and uh, people who are walking along the promenades. Uh, and then also if there's any uh, efforts that are being thought of to about what happens if these trails need to be widened in the future. <clears throat> sure. Um, so uh, specifically on Martin Goodman Trail, um, compared to, uh, I mean, I think it probably easiest to um, talk about in context of what it looks like today on Queens Key West. Um, some of the changes that we are implementing towards Queens Key East is that we are introducing um, an open planter with um, plants, but not just trees, but also understory planting uh, between the south side of the Martin Goodman Trail and the pedestrian walkway area. So that will provide uh, a sort of buffer um, for um, trail users uh, with, with the people that are walking south of the trail. Um, there's also uh, in the vertical um, dimension, there's also uh, a slightly raised above the sidewalk area. So that uh, not only allows for uh, also that kind of additional delineation between the users as, as well as providing us with um, actually from a green infrastructure perspective helps us with the tree planting and provides more um, soil volume. So it's sort of a double, um, doing double act there. So those are some of the things that we've um, kind of directly in response to the observations that we've made on Queens Key West that changes that we'll be implementing here. 
Also, um, what's not shown on the section, but in plan in the intersections itself, um, we're also kind of bringing the the trail, um, the marking of the trail um, at the intersections to the intersecting streets. So um, in the pilot itself um, in Queens Key West, uh, we did as part of the pilot that's been implemented um, last year, that is currently at uh, Lower Simcoe, at Lower Simcoe and at Bay, um, if you are there, you could see it's a slightly different treatment where we extend the asphalt all the way to the interconnecting north-south street. Um, again, that uh, gives a clear um, way of explaining that um, this is the kind of trail zone so that people waiting to cross to the north side of the street um, knows where to stand so that they are not in a zone where they'll be um, in a conflict zone where cyclists may Kind of run into pedestrian rating to cross so that that's an that is another kind of um, design element that we are introducing in queens key west and we have seen also some um, uh, um, results from the pilot that indicates that it is um, seems it, it does indicate that is helping with uh, reducing the conflict between um, trail users and uh, pedestrians thanks Yvonne. Uh, Liz, do you want to do one more before moving on? Yeah, I think you can do, we've got time to do more of these, Alex, so keep going. Okay, sounds yeah. good. Uh, so we have another question, and it's kind of relevant to the, the slide that we have on here right now. So uh, the question is, um, why is the plan to create this, or like create a native flowering meadow as an interim measure? Uh, rather than running buses um, to kind of alleviate congestion. Uh, and if there's any other insight that Waterfront Toronto can provide on uh, measures that are being thought of um, in this area and throughout the waterfront as it grows uh, to alleviate congestion. I know it might be a bit of a question around the Waterfront LRT, and I know that there's there's videos and presentation material from the Waterfront LRT team that have uh, have talked a bit about this, but maybe Pina, if you could uh, give a quick snapshot of that. Sure, and maybe I will answer it in conjunction with another question in the um, question list around the reduction of lanes. Um, so maybe I'll just start with that. Uh, that's a question from Daniel. Um, so yes, we are proposing to reduce uh, Queen's Key from the four lanes that are there now to the two lanes to enable the future Waterfront East LRT. Uh, to fit within the 38 meter right away of Queen's Key. This would commence, so maybe we can go to that, that section for just a second and then we'll come back to the meadow. Uh, this would um, run from um, essentially from Young Street where the streetcar will come from the underground tunnel um, and it will continue from Young Street all the way to um, Cherry Street, so through the extension of Queen's Key past Parliament to Cherry Street. And as was mentioned, there's lots of information online uh, on the Waterfront East LRT and how uh, this comes to fruition that we can happily share after the meeting. Um, then to the interim, so if we go to the, back to this slide, what this is saying is that Keyside, uh, as I mentioned when I was walking through the project components is taking the lead to build um, a small portion of that extent of Queen's Key in front of the Keyside site to enable the creation of blocks three, four, and five. So it's a portion approximately between Bonnie Castle and what we call Street A on the east, which is essentially where the silos are located. And it will say, it may be in an interim state um, if the Waterfront East LRT funding is not yet secured uh, when we go to, to build this portion of Queen's Key to enable the Keyside development. And in that case, uh, we will put an interim use in the area that will ultimately become the Waterfront East LRT. We're showing an option to do a seeded meadow, uh, which we think really aligns with this idea of uh, green infrastructure and uh, really amping up the amount of 
uh, permeable surfaces, but we are also investigating other options such as using it in the interim for additional road capacity, or as was noted in the question, using it possibly uh, to accommodate uh, transit vehicles, but it is only two blocks. So, uh, you know, it, it may have limited utility um, uh, for as a dedicated uh, bus area, but we are continuing to study that. So hopefully that covered off a few questions in one um, go. Thanks, Pina. Liz, do you want to take a few um, spoken ones while I figure out the next questions? Sure. No problem. Um, all right. I'm going to go to Edward first and then to Michael, uh, because Edward, I don't think you've asked a question yet. So, Edward, there you go. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Right. Hi, everyone. I'm Edward Nixon. I'm a board member of Waterfront for All. Um, Thank you for the the more detailed answer about the green, the, the aesthetically pleasing green grass in lieu of the streetcar. Uh, and I understand, I do, and thank you for clarifying that we're only, <coughs> pardon me, I have a old fashioned cold. Um, uh, you know, it only goes to Bonnie Castle, but I, and I appreciate that answer. I just, you know, maybe though it could be if you, you know, maybe it could depend. I mean, I know what you mean. It all depends on the funding and how fast we can build the LRT. And I understand that that's beyond everyone's control here today, but, uh, just as a thought experiment, maybe, you know, maybe a bus looping up to Parliament, to the Parliament in front uh, Ontario line station and then going back. It might, if, if there's, you know, hope, hopefully there isn't, but if there's a, a, lo a longer term delay, um, because I know that, you know, if, if you think about where the Ontario, uh, the Ontario uh, line station is going to be, it's um, about, it's 550 meters. It's an eight minute walk uh, for those of us who are, who are able to do that uh, from front and Parliament down to the top of Parliament slip. Which, you know, for me, it would be nothing, but for many people, it might be, it might not be, you know, um, might be, uh, might be a deal, especially in inclement weather. So it just, I just wanted to throw that out there. And I guess the other thing I wanted to talk to is when we're thinking about transportation and access, while it's obviously vitally important to think about the local experience for people who, who are, who are going to move into the area and people who are already living on the, directly on the waterfront or in, you know, in, the, in St. Lawrence or near, you know, in the distillery nearby, it, is, it strikes me that we're building an amazing destination um, here and that you are going to have hundreds of thousands of people who want to come down to the waterfront in this area. And I'm just, you know, is that is that potentiality, um, you know, uppermost in, in, in everyone's minds as we're thinking about transportation and access? Great. Thanks, Edward. Pina, I see your hand up, so we'll just go right to you. Well, it, um start with your first half of the question because I had a thought as you were talking that I didn't note, uh, which is another uh, alternative that we're studying, which I think is almost the best of both worlds if we can make it happen, is um, that to the east and uh, in some of the track we're proposing in Villiers Island to try um, greening the TTC right away. And um, in order to validate whether that might work, we do need to pilot this idea. So given that this is a short segment, we're also considering using this as a potential pilot site for the green track. And if that were the case, then it would have a sort of green uh, quality to it uh, and have uh, a landscape element, but it would also be um, a drivable surface and that's what really needs to be tested is whether if we do go for a green track uh, that works for the LRT perfectly well and we know that it's done all over the world but we know TTC also likes to use buses on this space so that's another option that we're studying that might be the be best of both worlds and might facilitate what you were just describing Edward and your, what was your second question I forgot second one was about um oh, how many Many visitors, right, being an attraction and destination, mm -hmm. and is that being considered? Like hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands of people coming down to the, down to the area, and just as we think about that and how we're gonna how we're gonna you know do that. Do I mean obviously some people are still gonna drive. That's a that's a reality, at least in the inter, in the next decade or so. But you know um, we obviously would probably prefer them not to drive directly here. So how are we going to address making it available to? Because you know 
waterfront for all, right? People are going to want, people who don't live here are going to want to come here. And I, I think it's going to be a fabulous project. And when it's finished, it's going to probably, you know, peop, it's going to be a major attractor. I think you're right. I hope you're right. Uh, I do think that there are lots of elements emerging in Keyside that will be an attraction. Uh, whether it be um, you know the Parliament slip proposal that we've previously shown public, uh, or the idea that one of the parcels, one of the blocks, might have a catalytic use on it, or the amazing parks emerging over on Villiers Island that will soon have a bridge uh, connecting from this site over to them. Um, as a result, I think the way we think about transportation planning for the area is that we have to offer lots of options. We have. Uh, and it reinforces the importance of the waterfront East LRT, both to Keyside and this area, but also to over to Villiers Island, uh, because we can build all the great stuff over on Villiers Island, be it parks, public realm, uh, housing, but we also need to ensure that we have access uh, over to the site. Uh, so it reinforces the importance of the waterfront East LRT. We're also giving, you know, making really great pedestrian spaces uh, hopefully, you know, one of the best bike pieces of bike infrastructure in the city. And Yvonne explained how it's, you know, really carefully being uh, designed and some of the lessons we took from Queens Key West, and then still providing opportunity for uh, automobile traffic into the area as well. Great. And charging stations for the electric cars that the few people who drive will be bringing, right? I'm just, just thinking about that. Whether yeah, it's going to be a char somewhere in the area where there's going to be charging stations, you know, because it, we're planning. I know that Waterfront Toronto has been very good about thinking about the long term. So that's just a, just going to throw that out there as a, side, as a, a final comment. Thank you so much. Great. Great suggestion. <laughs> Thank you. OK, um, Michael, I'm going to go to you uh, quickly and then I'm going to ask Yvonne to keep going with uh, the final part. Michael. OK, thanks. I was. Um... Just want to respond to uh, Edward as well. Uh, the Waterfront BIA has done uh, or is on, in the process of doing a survey regarding all of the different um, pu uh, public parking areas down here and uh, what their requirements are. So I think if we stay tuned to that, they'll be able to uh, give us some information on it. Um, and then just to Yvonne, uh, with regards to uh, wayfaring, I have just two little ones here, wayfaring sign elements and this type of thing at, at low. Spadina and Queensky West, um, uh, right in the ground, and it's done with mosaic. I think it was it was quite well done there. Um, there is a big sign that says "Look," and then it's got arrows pointing in either direction before crossing the bike path. Uh, is there something that we can do on the ground, on the posts, you know, and and just make it everywhere, uh, so that people, when they are about to cross from the pedestrian side through the bicycle lane. Uh, and then go across the traffic that they do have that look thing there because very often people won't even uh, stop and uh, that's unfortunate. The second one is um, with the signalization intersections that we're having at uh, Bonnie Castle and Small Street, um, at, I think it's at York and Lakeshore Boulevard. Uh, when you push the button to cross the street and the light changes, that you hear the, the words walk sign on walk sign on. So it's repeated several times. And I'm just wondering for blind and low vision uh, people, can we get, uh, I, I don't know if York is a pilot project or if all the other ones in Toronto are broken, but I'd like to see something like um, like that, just an audio signal uh, to, to help people who are blind, low vision to get across the street. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Michael. Yvonne, do you want to speak to Michael's points quickly and we'll keep going? Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> I'll address the first question um, with the markings on the pavement. Um, that that's I think here uh, in Queens Key East. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a plan showing the intersection, but um, we're going a step further actually. Um, in uh, in Queens Key West, we have uh, at the intersection we have those uh, the white granite um, stones that says "Look" um, as you approach the bike lanes. Um, in Queens Key East, we are actually going to extend. The asphalt, uh, Monument Trail, all the way to the edge of the um, of the connecting street, so that uh, and at the edge of that, we'll have the tactile detection plates um, for that are for the detectable plates for the visually impaired. So that that will be a clear point uh, where you're meant to stop and wait uh, before you cross over the Monument Trail. So we hope that can help um, with this uh, aspect of 
um, making it clear and more intuitive that this is where you're supposed to stand and wait. Um, but in, in some of the T intersections, uh, we do have T intersections like Parliament and um, Silo Street, for example. Um, we are uh, we also have the same kind of treatment with extending the Martin and Carroll Cross, but um, we have slightly different. We're looking at signages in different ways as well. So that's certainly um, signage and wayfinding um, elements are definitely part of the design um, that we're working on. Um, the second question as it, uh, relates to the audio, um, the uh, APS buttons. Um, I'm, I can't speak to the technicality of the signalization, but um, we do have our signals team who will be working on um, you know, placements and the programming of the signalization um, elements, um, including these um, pedestrian buttons, uh, which does has the audio component to it. So we'll take that feedback back and um, I don't actually know what the different types of audio um, buttons are, but um, I'm sure others on our team can address that. Yeah. Great, thank you. And that's why we have these meetings, right? Is to get this kind of yeah. feedback and input for the team. So that's perfect. Okay, Yvonne, let's go to your final part, um, which is activation and amenities. Um, so some questions we have for you to think about as Yvonne is going through this. Um, do these suggestions seem appropriate? Are they interesting? Are they exciting to you? Are there other amenities um, that we should consider in the designs as we move forward? So Yvonne, over to you for your par final part, and then we'll open it back up for um, some feedback and questions. Great, thanks Liz. Um, so as we um, we talked about kind of the functional elements, um, both from, you know, moving traffic of what the functional uses of the streets are. So the, this last kind of topic um, gets into how how the spaces are used from a <clears throat> from an enemy and how we activate these spaces um, as, as places that you can dwell and spend time in as opposed to just moving through. So some of the, uh, the inspirations that we take are, you know, essentially things from nature. So <clears throat> incorporating um, in this idea of uh, ecological art, birdhouses, uh, moving furniture. These are all really interesting things that we one may find on a street, but really using, um, taking it through the lens of nature and integrating and pulling elements from nature to create the spaces. Um, so, so for example, um, you know, using a, a log um, that really becomes a biodiverse uh, habitat for insects and birds. Um, incorporating uh, as part of the planting palette um, shrubs and woody shrubs and hedges that again provides habitat for birds and also food um, for for different uh, animals um, and from a, for seating um, not just formal seating like benches but also using more natural elements like stones and rocks that are have a, that also speaks to the history of the site um, to create seats and informal ways of um, engaging with the space um, on, on these various streets that's part of the Key Side Developments um, public realm site. So in the next slide, we have uh, some examples of what those may look like. So some of these, um, you know, using these elements to tell the story of Key Side, um, three kind of potential uh, examples of what we could do with these things are um, things that we call socialites, for example, using using these natural elements to create informal seating um, arrangements that you know, enhance um, social gathering. So not just, you know, sitting next to each other, but, you know, groupings that are conducive to, you know, meeting people and also having an environment where you can uh, socialize with others. Um, and another way that we could use these devices are, um, are these marker elements, something that is unusual or um, really distinct that creates a wayfinding element. So let's speak, harking back to the last question around wayfinding, um, using kind of more interesting elements to mark special moments like entrances to um, the specific um, buildings, for example, or key intersections, for example. Um, so those will be uh, kind of marker elements. Um, and then uh, and then thirdly, um, using using material in a way that also teaches people about the thinking that goes behind the, the, the design and the science of the street. So some of these um, green infrastructure elements, uh, for example, this picture on the bottom right um, that has this uh, essentially a sediment path that where the water running from the sidewalk would drain into the planter, um, incorporating kind of natural or historical artifacts from the site um, into these 
drainage pads so it really tells a kind of a subtle way to tell the story behind the site um and add a bit of interest and uh, almost like um things that you discover as you as you move through and experience um, these many streets so all these together you know create an identity that um you know, create the space so we imagine um, you can tell a friend here I'll wait for you over there by the big log on Tuesday at five or um, you know having uh, being able to sit under the tree on the street and really just um, inhabit the space as opposed to just walking through so these are um, also I want to bring it back to uh, when we started the presentation talking about the indigenous engagement piece um, these are all elements that we think are really rife with uh, opportunity to incorporate and a layer of indigenous history and stories. Um, and we're really excited about engaging the community on, on, on that, um, on, with uh, input on these elements and, and other ways to incorporate the kind of narrative in there. So uh, we'll walk, into, walk through some uh, more examples of how these would be applied um, on the next slide. Um, this would be an example um, on, on an inner street um, or maybe this could also happen on Queen's Key, for example, in a major entrance or uh, an entryway into the Keyside development um, uh, element like a marker stone or a marker element that is kind of large and unusual that really draws attention um, and creates a wayfinding element and uh, really creates a special moment along, along, the, streets, along the streetscape. Um, and then next slide, please. And similarly, um, the storytelling stones and the socialite stones that create seating uh, in combination with formal benches um, that would be integrated with um, on, in this case, it's an example of what it would look, what it may look like on the water's edge promenade. Um, the stones not only becomes edge details um, to protect also to, to contain the planting as well as um, informal seating or children can, you know, also play around it and on it. Um, and uh, in combination with the actual benches um, creates these zones where people can gather and uh, um, socialize with each other. And lastly, um, and another example um, on the next slide on Queen's Key, uh, again, this idea of utilizing these edges, um, incorporating these seating pockets um, that are kind of nestled into the planting um, with uh, the formal seating with the bench, um, which also provides accessible seating and companion seating um, at the end of the bench and it, an, a, alongside, um, as well as the slightly more informal seating with these rock elements. And uh, so these are, you know, early days. Um, when we, as I mentioned, we're really excited um, to engage further the com uh, indigenous community and the wider community about some of these ideas. And we hope to bring in kind of a more lush um, and more interesting layer of narrative into these elements as we uh, advance the design of the next phase. Back to you, Liz. Great. Thank you, Yvonne. So we are moving into our final part of the questions. I do see some questions rolling in in the Q&A, um, but of course you're invited to raise your hand as well. Um, and I do see someone has raised their hand. Um, if we go to the next slide though, we do have a poll. So perhaps Alex, you can start the poll um, and then we can go to the, to the raised hand. Yeah, so we have one question here, which is just about what special elements or features would be interesting to see on these local streets and the water's edge promenade. So you can choose a variety. There's also another category in this one. Uh, so because we've got that other category, I'll leave this poll open a little bit longer as well uh, before we show the results. So uh, Liz, I'll just turn it back to you. Great. Thank you, Alex. All right, Joe, I see your hand up. If you just want to introduce yourself, um, you should be able to unmute. Joe, are you there? I am, Liz. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm a resident uh, of the area, and I just have a question. I think Pina actually answered some of it, but it relates to the interim stretch of Queen's Key, where there's protection for the LRT uh, a protection board in the middle of the roadway. And that extends roughly, if I understood Pina's uh, response, extends from small street over to the silos. Is that correct? Yeah, we Close don't it. know the exact um, sure. boundaries 
quayside extends from Bonnie Castle to the Bonnie silos. Bonnie Castle, sorry. So yep. the most we're going to build is Bonnie Castle to the silos, but we really right. absolutely need to build the portion between small and the silos. Right. And it just seems that we're going to be reducing um, uh, Queen's Key from two lanes to one way in, in both directions, fairly obvious. I assume this is supported by traffic studies that support that this won't be a major bottleneck in traffic, particularly during rush hours. Because now during four to six, seven to nine in the morning, people are even coming off of Lakeshore Drive to go around and try to get onto the on-ramp for the Gardner Expressway at Lower Jarvis. So I assume it has been. I'm just asking for confirmation more than anything else. Um, yes, it has been uh, extensively studied from a transportation perspective over the course of many years. I would say over the course of the last 10 to 15 years, um, we studied it a few times and we continue to study it. Um, so we will continue to study it as we okay. take our design forward from 60%, uh, which is where we're at now, to 90% to design. No, I, I realize that, but this interim solution here for uh, for Queen's Key is going to be in place for several years, I would assume. The interim condition will be in place until the waterfront East LRT right, uh, which in is this many portion years, is built. Which is many years from now. We don't know the time lag. I mean, really great news from okay. Council last week uh, in terms of funding the next phase of design for that project, but there's no yep. capital funding secured yet. Yeah, that, that's my point. It's going to be for, for several years before the LRT comes through and, and all of Queen's Key gets converted to this type of intersection or cross-section. And so during that time, we're going to, this bottleneck is going to be there and it's going to have a, a pretty serious effect on traffic. Just yeah, so a comment. That is a great comment and we will um, okay. take that one away. Thank you, Joe. Okay, just uh, on... Do you have another question? Uh, if if I can, if not, we can move on. No, no, it's okay. Quickly, you're good. It's a very quick question. Yeah. On the slide that showed uh, scheduling for the various components, yeah. like Lake Phil of, uh, for the Parliament Street slip is to begin, I guess, in January. Yeah, 2024. I'm interested in that one. And the other one is... Uh, for the Parliament Street Queens Key construction is early 2025. Mm -hmm. Are just the question: Are the scheduling dates put in here aspirational or are they firm? Like, if Flakeville construction is going to happen in January 2024, like the design approvals, budgeting, it's all been completed by now, wouldn't it? I can answer Joe's questions on this yeah, as well. Yeah. So for the these. These dates are preliminary, but they're pretty accurate, I would say. Um, January 2024 is firm. Uh, we already have completed design for the lake fill, have our funding in place, and have a contractor, uh, uh, a contract awarded to the contractor, and oh, the, they are expected to mobilize in January 2024. Okay. Um, so that one's firm. After that, uh, these are these are targets. Um, we're at the 60% design milestone, so they do rely on us, you know, getting through all of our uh, finishing okay. up design and getting approvals in place, but they're they're pretty accurate targets at this point. We have a construction manager already on site. Uh, they've mobilized and they are, um, you know, pretty, pretty actively working at helping us uh, get these components under construction uh, okay. approximately in these timelines. Sounds great. One one final one, if I may, Liz, real quick. Uh, we do have a we do have quite All a right. few questions. Carry on. Right. Okay. Carry on. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Great, Alex. If we can go to some of the written questions, please. Thanks, Liz. So yeah, there's a couple of questions around, or there was a question that came in from a, a while ago around um, accommodating. Um, accommodating dogs in the space. Uh, maybe Pina, if you want to touch upon that. Sure. Um, so I think there's a few answers to this question. First of all, as um, we already have a dog off leash area in the neighborhood in Aiken Place Park. Um, 
then on top of that, uh, we would have, um, actually we had a mandatory requirement that the developer um, include a dog off leash area as part of the development um, project. And so they do have a dog off leash area proposed within the community forest that is uh, within the central block of the northern development parcels, parcels one, two, and three. Um, and then lastly, uh, within the design of the public realm, um, you saw, uh, you know, Yvonne spoke of some interesting erratics and um, uh, stone areas that we are uh, putting around some of the planting. We're also looking at some of the different kinds of barriers we can put around those plantings and are investigating, you know, strategically where to place those so that if they do get used by dogs, uh, that they would be at an offset that would ensure that the planting maybe uh, isn't necessarily the preferred location for uh, some of their business. So lots of thought around dogs. Oh, and the, the one last thing though around Silo Park. We don't know the program for Silo Park yet. We're waiting to know more about Block 5 and how Silo Park will coordinate with Block 5. Block 5 is a site that is earmarked for potential um, Toronto TDSB school. So, you know, the, if there is a school there, it completely changes the program of Silo Park. Um, we will do consultation before we commence the design of Silo Park, and we will for sure be looking for input into the program of Silo Park. So no set program for Silo Park yet. And Pina, just a follow-up question. Uh, are the developer created off-leash dog area is publicly accessible or only for residents of those buildings? They're intended to be publicly accessible. Okay, thank you. The whole community forest is intended to be publicly accessible, which you can see in the image here is the sort of green, very light green that somebody is pointing to with the hand uh, down the center of these three development parcels, par parcels um, one, two, and three. And in a somewhat similar topic, you know, there's a couple of questions about public washrooms, a couple of people noting in the comments that there is a public washroom at the Sherburne Common South near the splash pad and skate rink. Uh, but does this public realm plan consider public washrooms in, in any way at the moment? Uh, sure. So again, we don't know the program for Silo Park. Public washroom could always be on the list of program for the park. Uh, I'm certain that if Block 5 ends up being, you know, a, a public um, use, there'll be washrooms associated with that. Parliament slip activation um, on the floating dock, which is on the right side of the slip, uh, there will be public washrooms uh, included in, in the concessions that will be planned for Parliament slip. Um, and there might be other opportunities as well. Oh, and the community center, the Aqua Luna Community Center, which is in the ground floor of the Aqua Luna building, which is the building just to the west of the slip. Maybe move the hand over. Yeah, uh, has uh, public washrooms in it as well. So lots already planned. Probably more opportunities will emerge as some of the development blocks start to emerge as well. Thanks, Pina. Pina, I'm going to give you a break for a moment. And uh, we forgot to, not, we didn't forget, you probably, maybe, maybe some of you thought we forgot about our poll that we've had open uh, during this time. I was worried that I forgot. So I was just <laughs> going to uh, close that for folks. And I can just report back that, um, so from that activation and amenities poll, we asked people what uh, special elements and features would be interesting. Uh, getting a lot of of interesting uh, of of good feedback there. Um, the top two ones in there were natural elements such as dead wood and stone. So stuff that Yvonne uh, was sharing through those slides uh, and opportunities to uh, have public art and indigenous representation through uh, that space. So uh, thank you all for for answering that poll. And I don't, Liz, don't see any, do you want me to keep going? Yes, please. All right, can do. Um, 
folks need to find where we were. Uh, there was around activation and animation. We've got, sorry, we've got a bunch of short little comments in here. So I'm just trying to make sure that we can find the questions. I'll just note that if uh, we're seeing your comments as they're coming through, we'll be recording them into a summary. So if I don't acknowledge all of them, uh, don't think that they aren't being seen. We'll be preparing a summary report that has uh, has these in them. Um, Liz, were there any that are, are kind of striking your eye at the moment that we want to go back to back? Because there's a couple in the ecology and mobility sections that we didn't get to that we could could go back into. Yeah, that's that's fine. Um, I did just note there's a question here from Jeannie about um, Parliament slip. Just whether it's preliminary. Um, so I'm just wondering, Pina, if you want to speak a little bit about the the timing there or where that's at? Um, I didn't see the question, but I will do my best. Um, so the it's, part, par it's Parliament slip preliminary. Is that the activation project I'm assuming? Uh, what you see here yeah. um, ghosted in? Oh uh, yeah, this is a preliminary design, uh, a vision for Parliament slip. I think the uses we're all really excited about. They include um, a floating dock, uh, with concessions, uh, which you see here illustrated on the right side. Uh, they also include a transportation pier, which is just cut off uh, at the bottom of the page, uh, which could be a mobility hub, a transportation mobility hub for um, things like water taxis, uh, a water shuttle, if, you know, if one uh, emerges on our waterfront. And then, of course, the sort of centerpiece being the idea of uh, two uh, harbor swimming pools. So being able to swim right next to Lake Ontario, but in water that is, you know, appropriate for swimming. So I think we're really excited about the program, how the design evolves, given feedback from stakeholders, and our design review panel is still kind of in the works, um, but it's preliminary at this point. Okay, great. Thanks, Pina. Um, just wanted to acknowledge a comment here from Elizabeth. Um, that Indigenous representation is important uh, because of all the buildings north of Waterfront as a connection. So just a just a note there. Um, Alex, have you have you found any more questions that you want to read? Um, I noticed here, Pina, that there's or for the team at Waterfront Toronto from Azam, Manitoba and Nova Scotia have recommendations and guidelines for accessible trails playgrounds and outdoor spaces that might be of interest to the accessibility committee that they might not be aware of. So that's super helpful. And I'm assuming you can share that with the group. That's great. I was just responding to that question in oh, okay. text. There's Alex, a couple you? other, yeah, a couple other questions, uh, just picking up ones from, from previous sections. Uh, just looking at if there's a, kind of comments for the team to consider around if there's ways planters can be combined, raised to give trees more space, protect from salt infiltration, uh, provide seeding, uh, those sorts of things. I know part of that was covered through uh, some of the pilot project, but maybe we'll just speak to that, um, just some of the considerations that, or maybe reiterate just some of the considerations that are going into that process? Sure, I can speak to that. Um, yeah, we certainly are trying to combine planters wherever we can, um, with, with also uh, balancing the space for pedestrians so that, you know, we we still allow people to cross through so it doesn't become a barrier. So the, the balance between making it um, still navigable, but um, ensuring uh, also providing as much space as possible. So we, uh, we do know, you know, Having a larger shared space is better for the trees and as well as the uh, understory planting. So in places like Lakeshore, for example, um, that's a good opportunity to have much long uh, continuous planting beds. Um, as well on the south side of, um, on Queen's Key, you know, between the streetcar and the Mindgumman Trail and also between the Mindgumman Trail and the uh, pedestrian walkway area on the south side. Those are also two um, um, 
uh, options um, and really good opportunities to have extensive planting, um, but still integrating seeding as well. So, and we are, uh, Queen's itself um, is on the screen. We do have a raised edge and that is uh, exactly to try to limit the impact of salt, um, which is quite impactful for, for planting. So we certainly are thinking about that. Um, so on that slide where we looked at different edge treatment, um, that's certainly an element, um, how, uh, whether we have an edge or not. Um, and again, we have different, Slightly different strategy for different areas. Um, on the water sedge promenade, where we don't expect it to be salted, for example, then we won't. We're not anticipating to have a curved edge, um, but for on Queens Key, where it does um, traditionally have more salt, as in as a as a um, as a condition, um, we do are uh, planning to integrate a, a low curb. Um, also, with the introduction of the erratics, those also provide a level of protection. Um, combined with like the the, the combining of um, tree planters um, into a zone. So so yeah, these are some of the things that we are certainly thinking about. Great, thanks, Yvonne. Alex, are there other questions? Uh, yeah, we've got a couple other questions. There's a couple that are similarly worded to some of our responses that we've the team has has given already around like uh, just in skimming through them, we can see that the 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 role of uh, creating a balance of how people move through the space is really important, making sure that there's safe uh, separation between people using the trails, the the pedestrian walkways and at intersections, um, looking at ways in which uh, we can um, provide ways to people to move uh, efficiently through this space. So uh, a lot of uh, good comments and feedback for the team to continue uh, keeping in mind uh, as planning goes forward for, for Queens Key East and the other streets. Um, Great. Go Thank back you. to you, Liz. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's why we have meetings like this, right? Is to get great feedback um, from people. And we had almost 100 people on tonight. And I think we had almost 300 register, which means that we can send everyone the survey um, after tonight. I think, Alex, if you could also post uh, the survey in the chat for folks, that would be great. And I believe that the, um, the, PowerPoint or the deck from tonight will be posted on Waterfront Toronto's blog. So we can make sure people have that as well. Um, so quickly, if we just want to remind people of the schedule, because I don't really see any other questions, um, I'm going to just move to close. So um, Pina, thank you again for going through this, uh, what to expect at Keyside. We just wanted to make sure everyone had this fresh in their minds before we sign off. Of course, today is the public realm public meeting. Uh, we do have a questionnaire or survey um, for you that you can fill in and tell all your friends about as well. It's super important that we get feedback. Um, and as Pina indicated, um, Lake Phil construction will move forward January 2024. Of course, these dates are preliminary and will be confirmed as soon as design advances. Um, one thing to note here is the creation of a construction liaison committee as well. Um, so yeah, just a reminder on this. Um, so I, uh, Deputy Mayor, do you want to do you want to offer some notes of of closing before I pass it to Pina to officially close the meeting? Thank you so much, Liz, and thank you everyone for the engagement and the discussion. I know that this uh, conversation um, and presentation about the pu public realm had so many different aspects to it. Um, but, you know, uh, the questions and the expertise that everyone was able to give and will continue to give on the survey is so invaluable. So thank you for that. Thank you for the excellent presentation, the poll questions, and for um, helping us make the most of our, our time together. Um, I heard uh, really clearly um, input around accessibility, uh, questions about the choices when it comes to planting, uh, the composition of the green space, traffic and congestion, 
road safety, and how we incorporate all the elements to make this an incredible, um, livable and green community. And that is all as was shared is gonna be reflected back in the reporting of this and included in the way forward. So you can anticipate more information and another opportunity for us to be able to uh, engage with this uh, really excellent uh, plan and to see it uh, come together and come to life. So thank you uh, so much to everybody for being here and thanks so much for taking us through the evening uh, so expertly, Liz. Great, thank you, Deputy Mayor Malik and Pina, over to you. Um, likewise, I want to say a lot of thank yous. Uh, thank you to uh, Deputy Mayor Malik for all of your uh, inspiring words, to uh, Shelley, our Indigenous uh, consultant lead for kicking us off so uh, thoughtfully, and then to everybody who participated uh, tonight. Uh, actually, I get so inspired by these meetings. Uh, the questions were just so thoughtful this evening, and there were many of them, and we really appreciate them, and I hope we were able to answer all of them, and if not, you know where to find us, um, and also for all your great suggestions and ideas. Uh, we always learn from these meetings, and we certainly did tonight, so thank you. We will take all of this with us as we move uh, forward in the design uh, through the 60% and the 90% design uh, milestones. Great. And thank, thank you, Liz. You You're amazing, as usual. You're all amazing. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.